الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Some days of no fast uh, within the 10 days of Zuhijjah Last week we talked about the virtues of the 10 days of Zuhijjah and coming soon will be the 9th of Zulhijjah, which will be Sunday. And this day is known as the day of Arafah. Arafah is considered the greatest day in the Islamic calendar in terms of virtue and honor. Many of you may think, isn't the greatest time Laylatul Qadr? Laylatul Qadr is a night. So, in Islam, the greatest night is considered Laylatul Qadr. But Yawm is day. And the greatest day, meaning the daytime, is the day of Arafah. The meaning of Arafah means to know. To know. In the Quran, we have the verse, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّةِ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا that jinn and mankind was not created except to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the tafsir, the interpretation of this verse, according to the Sahaba, Ya'budu, worship Allah, means to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have this word, Arafa again. It's a very significant word, as we can see, that the purpose of man is to worship Allah in order that he knows Allah. And the greatest day in the Islamic calendar is also known as Yom Arafah, the day to know, meaning to worship Allah in order that you know Him. The ulama have said, Man Arafah nafsahu, he who knows himself, Arafah Rabbahu, he who knows himself, Arafah, he who knows himself will know his Lord, meaning the one who submits himself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will truly know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The scholars have said regarding Allah that he was a hidden treasure. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was a hidden treasure and he desired to become known. Allah azza wa jal desired to become known. So what did he do? He created creation. So we see this word again. <coughs> To know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how it is the essence of one's purpose in life. And hence why the greatest day in Islam is referred to as Yawm Arafah, the day to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there were many significant things that took place on the day of Arafah in the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The verse of the Quran where Allah azza wa jal says, al yawma akmaltu lakum dinah. That today we have perfected your religion for you. And that we have perfected our favor upon you. That we have made Islam as your religion. This verse was revealed on which day? It was revealed on the day of Arafah. It is the day in which Islam came in its perfect form, meaning it was complete. What do we mean by it is complete? After this day of the day of Arafah, on the Friday, when this verse was revealed, no more verses regarding something being haram and halal came after this specific day of Arafah. So it is the day in which Allah Azawajal reveals the a verse of the Quran in which He perfected Islam. There are many times where Allah Azza wa Jal, we mentioned this last week, where He takes a qasr. He swears and takes an oath by certain things. Last time we mentioned, wal fajr wa layalin ash. By the time of fajr. Allah Azza wa Jal swears by the time of fajr. Meaning He takes an oath, a qasr by it because it's a special time. Wa layalin ash. And the ten nights. This refers to the ten days of Zul. Hijjah. In another verse of the Quran, in the verses of Surah Al-Burud, 
Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالسَّمَاءِ ذَاتِ الْبُرُوجِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْمَعْرُوجِ And Allah Azza wa Jal swears by the promised day. What is the promised day? The promised day is referring to the day of judgment. And then Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَشَاهِدٍ وَمَشْهُودٍ And by the witnesser and the witness days. What is the shahid? Which day is the shahid? This is the day of Jum'ah. And what is the mashhud? The mashhud is referring to the day of Arafah. So Allah Azza wa Jal, He takes customs by these days in these last surahs of the Quran. You wouldn't know by reading the translation directly, but when we receive the interpretation by the Sahaba, they say that the promised day refers to the day of judgment. The shahid day, the witnessing day, refers to Yomul Jum'ah. And the mashhud, the witness day, refers to the day of Arafah. Why is it known as the witness day? This is the day in which when all the souls gathered. Before we entered the earth, in our human form, we were all gathered in the land of the souls. This is known as Alam al-Arwah, the land of the souls. This is before we came to the dunya, we were with Alam al-Arwah, land of the souls. And Allah Azza wa Jal gathered all of the souls. And He says, Alas to be of people, that am I not your Lord? Qal, then all of the souls replied, Bala, of course, shahidna, that we bear witness to the fact that you are our Lord. Hence why, Yawm al-Arafah is known as the witness day. This is the day in which the souls bear witness to the fact that Allah Azza wa Jal is their Lord. The day of Arafah is also a day in which there are many virtues. So we will read some hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ talks about the day of Arafah. He says, After the ayami yawma Arafah, that the best of all days is the day of Arafah. In the next hadith, he says, Janzir Allah Ta'ala ila sama'i dunya, fayubahi bi ahli al-ardi ahli sama. Allah Azza wa Jal descends to the lowest of the skies, meaning metaphorically. He sends most of his word, mercy on this day, and Allah Azza wa Jal, He shows off to the people in the sky, meaning the angels, about the people on earth. Why? Because this is the day of Arafah. This is the day in which people seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which other religion in the world could produce four million people gathered in one place, all making dua, asking for forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Only the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can produce such a result. Hence why Allah azza wa jal, when the day of Arafah comes, He shows off the people of the earth, meaning look at the sight to the people in the sama, to the heavens. The Prophet وسلم, says in the next hadith, مَا مِنْ يَوْمٍ أَكْثَرَ مِنْ أَنْ يُؤْتِكَ اللَّهُ فِيهِ عَبْدًا مِنَ النَّارِ مِنْ يَوْمِ Arafah. That there is no day on which Allah Azza wa Jal sets more people free from hell than He does on the day of Arafah. And the Prophet وسلم, says, خَيْرُ الدُّعَاءِ دُعَاءُ يَوْمَ Arafah. That the best of all du'as is made on the day of Arafah. And one thing that we must do or should try to do on the day of Arafah is to fast. The Prophet وسلم, says, سِيَامُ يَوْمُ Arafah." إِنِّي أَحْتَسِبُ اللَّهِ أَنْ يُكَفِّرَ السَّنَةَ أَلَّتِي قَبْلَهُ وَالسَّنَةَ أَلَّتِي بَعْدَهُ That I am confident that fasting on the day of Arafah will make up for the sins of the year that went before, before you, meaning the year before. And it will make up for the sins that will come after. Such is the greatness of the day of Arafah that Abdullah ibn Mubar, he saw a very pious individual from the first generation of Islam, crime. And it was Sufyan al-Thawri. Sufyan al-Thawri was considered one of the most pious people in that time. And he was crying profusely on the day of Arafah. And he was asked, you are a pious individual who we see perform good actions. So why are you crying on this day so much? 
He says that the worst person on the day of Arafah is not the most sinful person. The worst person on the day of Arafah is not the most sinful person. The worst person on the day of Arafah, he says, I had a moment where I thought on this day I will not be forgiven by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the worst person on the day of Arafah is the one who would think that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not forgive him on this day. There is a, another very famous person from the early generations of the Muslims called Fudayb ibn Ayyad. He says on the day of Arafah, he nudged the person next to him. And he said, there are many people here on this day during the Hajj period on the day of Arafah. Do you think that if all of these people went to the richest king in the land and he asked for a penny from him, that the king would say no? The person said, not at all. Then Fudayl ibn Ayyad says, Allah Azza wa Jal is far more wealthy and far more generous than any king that has ever come. And he will surely answer the prayers of all of those people that make dua on this day. So there are numerous things that we can do. The first, as we mentioned, is to fast the day of Arafah. So the Ashi Siddiqa says, fasting the day of Arafah is like the equivalent of making 1,000 fasts. Another thing that we do is the Prophet said, the best of all days to make a dua is the day of Arafah. And the best of what I have said and what all the Anbiya have said is the following. لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير. This does not sound like a dua, but the Prophet says the best of all duas that I and the Prophet have said on the day of Arafah is this. لا إله إلا الله that there is no God except Allah وحده لا شريك له. He is alone and he has no partners. له الملك to him belongs the kingdom. وله الحمد to him belongs all praise. وهو على كل شيء قدير. He is powerful over all things. Why is this considered the best dua? It does not even sound like we've asked for anything in this dua. But this is considered the best dua on the day of Arafah. Why? Because it combines two things. In this, we have the words La ilaha illallah. The Prophet says, The best of all dhikr is La ilaha illallah. And the Prophet says, The best of all dua is to say Alhamdulillah. So in this, we have the combination of the two. When you say, Wala hamd, to him belongs all the praise, you've combined the best dhikr and you've combined the best dua. And the Prophet says, the person who says this ten times in the morning, ten times in the evening, it will be the equivalent of set, uh, setting free four slaves from the children of Banu Ismail. If he says ten times in the morning, Ten times in the year. The person who says it 100 times in a day, the Prophet ﷺ says it's like the equivalent of freeing 10 slaves and no one will have a better day than this individual except the one who said it more times. So this is a time where we should make lots of dua, specifically saying this, La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahul mulku wa lahul hum, wa hu ala kulli shayin qadeer. The next thing is to make sure you say the takbirat of the shriek after every first salah, which is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walidahi. And of course, make lots of dua. And if you struggle to make dua all day, then which time should you try to make sure you make your dua? The best time in the whole day of the day of Arafah will be between Asr and Maghrib. If you do not spend a lot of the day in dua, you can do different things. You can do dhikr, you can rest, you can do many things. But if you are going to make dua, the main time to try to make your dua, if you only have one time, is between Asr and Maghrib. Because this is known as the time of Ijab. And of course, to seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is also the same day in which the Prophet ﷺ made his final khutbah. The final khutbah speech of the Prophet ﷺ that ever took place was on the day of a Friday 
on the day of Arafah. But the Prophet ﷺ told us that there is no superiority of a black man to a white man, of an Arab to a non-Arab. No great leader in history comes before the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ giving such explicit statements about abolishing racism. This is the first major influential figure in history that said something so explicitly against racism. The Prophet ﷺ also mentioned that you should treat your women well. And if they treat you well, then you should make sure you should look after them. But the Prophet ﷺ is also speaking about making sure that men and women are both treated fairly. This happened on the day of Arafah. So I pray Allah Azza wa Jal gives us the tawfiq to make the most of that day and especially to try and fast on that day. And if you have not given your zakat this year, then it's time to get a move on because the year has almost come to an end. And if you still haven't given it, a good day to choose would be the day of Haram. So you will come to the book, we will just read maybe a few hadith, what time is more next or six, four, so we finish about four today. And Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman أنه سعد صلى مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم من الليل قال فلما دخل في الصلاة قال الله أكبر ذو الملكوت والجبروت والكبرياء والعظمة ثم قرأ البقرة ثم رقع بكوءه نحو من قيامه وكان يقول سبحان ربي العظيم وسبحان ربي العظيم ثم رفع رأسه فكان قيامه نحو من بكوءه وكان يقول لربي الهم لربي الهم ثم سجد فكان سجوده نحو من قيامه وكان يقول سبحان ربي الأعلى سبحان ربي الأعلى ثم رفع رأسه فكان ما بين السجدتين نحو من السجود من السجود وكان يقول ربي اغفر لي ربي اغفر لي حتى قرأ البقرة وآل إمران والنساء المائدة والأنعام شرب الذي شفت في المائدة والأنعام. It's a very long thing. Hudayf ibn Yawan relates that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم prayed in جماعة at night time. And when he began the prayer, saying Allahu Akbar, he said the words, Allahu Akbar, Dhul Malakud, Wal Jabahu, Wal Kibriyai, Wal Adama. This sounds familiar, yes? We have a similar thing that we read in Tarawih. And we say, Subhan Dhul Mulki, Wal Malakud, Subhan Dhul Izzati, Wal Adama. It's Wal Adama. Sometimes you see well, alama, but this is a mistake. Well, alama would mean greatness. Whereas if you make the zaba on the second letter, the va, uh, a sukun, you will change it from greatness to meaning bones. Such is the delicateness of the Arabic language. So it is not alama; it is alama, and it's mulki with a pesh, a dhamma. Sometimes you might hear people say milki or uh, malaki. This is wrong as well. Milk would mean possession. Malak would mean angel. Another word that would be fine if you said it would be malik because malik would mean king. Like we have in Surah Fatiha, maliki yawmiddi. In one of the other kira'a, you can read it, maliki yawmiddi. Master of the Day of Judgment or King of the Day of Judgment. But you cannot say Alvama, you have to say Alvama. It changes the meaning from greatness to bones. And you cannot say Allah Azza wa Jal is the possessor of bones. We say he's the possessor of greatness. And it is Mulki wal Malaku. And then it says that the possessor of the kingdom, overwhelming force, grandeur, exaltedness. Then he read Surah Al Baqarah. So we can see in this uh, standing, the Prophet ﷺ must have read a very long prayer because Surah Baqarah would probably take around two hours. Afterwards he bowed and his bowing was similar to his standing. And then he said to them, in his bowing, in his ruku, Subhana Rabbi Adi. Then he raised his head and his standing was similar to his bowing. And then he said, Rabbi Alham, Rabbi Alham. So sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would say different things. 
when we come from Ruku, we say, Rabbana walakarham. Yes? But in this case, the Prophet says, Rabbi alham, Rabbi alham. So that shows you sometimes the Prophet would say slightly different things. And then he prostrated and he said, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. What does this mean? It means, Glory to my Lord, the Most High. Think, when you're in sujood, you are in the lowest position. You are close to the ground. You're basically as low as the earth is. When you're in that low position, you say, Subhana Rabbi al-A'la. You're in your lowest position, but you're acknowledging the highness and the glory of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he was saying, to my Lord belongs all praise. To my Lord belongs all praise. He then prostrated, and his prostration was similar to his standing. Next he raised his head, and what was between his prostration was similar to the prostration before. And he was saying, my Lord forgive me, my Lord forgive me. And in this namaz he read, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran, Surah Al-Misa, Surah al maida so the Prophet ﷺ clearly in some of the night prayers read many of the long surahs. Uh, the next, uh, so we have one example where the Prophet ﷺ recites many verses of the Quran. And in the next hadith we'll see something slightly different. The next hadith is an Aish that called Qama Rasulullah ﷺ bi ayatin min al Quran laylatan. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha said, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, stood the entire night reciting just a single verse of the Quran. So this shows you the different practices of the Prophet Sometimes he would recite many long surahs, meaning many verses of the Quran. Some nights he would recite just one verse all night, just repeating that single verse. Because Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would find a verse, and in this case it was the verse where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, If you punish them, then they are your slaves. And if you forgive them, then you are mighty and wise. The Prophet ﷺ kept repeating this verse. Why? Because it has a meaning of bringing fear into the heart. Because it talks about Allah punishing his servants. But it also brings hope to the heart. Because it also talks about Allah Azza wa Jal forgiving his servants. So sometimes when the Prophet ﷺ came across a verse like this, rather than just trying to go to the next verse and the next verse, he would recite that one verse for the entire night. The next hadith, An Abdullah, Qala sallaytu laylatan ma'a Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, falam yazal qa'iman hatta hamamtu bi amri suhim, qila lahu wa ma hamamtu bihi, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, One night I prayed alongside the Messenger of Allah وسلم, and he remained standing for so long, so much so that I was on the verge of doing something bad. He was asked, What were you on the verge of doing? He replied, I was about to sit and exit the prayer and leave the Prophet. So sometimes you would see that the Sahaba, they would be enthusiastic and they would want to join the Prophet in his prayer. But a lot of the time the Prophet prayer was too long for the Sahaba to keep up with. So they would get tempted to leave the prayer. Obviously this is something which is disrespectful to do. So the Prophet you would see many examples in his lifetime where sometimes he would shorten the prayer or lengthen the prayer. If there were many young healthy people in the congregation, the Prophet ﷺ would lengthen the prayer. If there were many old or ill people within the prayer, he would shorten the prayer. Sometimes the young Sahaba, like Al Hassan wal Hussein, would try to play with the Prophet ﷺ in his prayer, where they would sit on the back of the Prophet ﷺ. In these situations, the Prophet ﷺ would make his sajda longer. So depending on the situation, the Prophet ﷺ would vary the length of his prayer. The next hadith, An Aisha, Anna Nabiya 
كان يصلي جالسا فيقرأ وهو جالس فإذا بقي من قراءته قدر ما يكون ثلاثين أو أربعين آية قام فقرأ وهو قام قائم ثم ركع وسجد ثم صنع في الركعة الثانية مثل ذلك عائشة ليس the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم used to pray sitting and he would recite sitting when the amount of what is between 30 or 40 verses remained of his recitation he would stand up and recite standing, then he would bow and prostrate. Thereafter, he would use to do the same in the second cycle. So here we see an example of where the Prophet ﷺ would sometimes sit in the prayer. Now when it comes to sitting in the prayer, a person is only allowed to do so if he is incapable of standing. The only exception where he can choose to sit is if it's a nafal prayer. If it is a nafal prayer, a person can choose to sit and it won't be a sin or something impermissible. However, in the case of the Prophet ﷺ, his reward would not be reduced, even if he prayed sitting. In our situation, if we pray sitting, the reward reduces by half. In the case of the Prophet ﷺ, if he prays sitting, his reward is not reduced at all. The next hadith, and Abdullah ibn al-Shaqi, قَالَ سَأَلْتُ عَائِشَةَ فَرَضِيَ اللَّهُ تَعَلَىٰ عَنْهُ أَنْهَا أَنْ صَلَاتِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ وَسَلَمْ أَنْ تَطَوْئِهِ فَقَالَ كَانَ يُسَلِّ لَيْلًا تَوِيلًا قَائِمًا وَلَيْلًا تَوِيلًا قَائِمًا فَإِذَا قَرَأَ وَهُوَ قَامٍ رَكَأَ وَسَجَدَ وَهُوَ قَامٍ قَائِمٌ وَإِذَا قَرَأَ about the Messenger of Allah وسلم, voluntary prayer. She replied, he would pray a substantial part of the night standing and a substantial part of the night sitting. When he would recite standing, he would bow and prostrate from the standing position. And when he recited sitting, he would bow and prostrate from the sitting position. The next hadith, and Hafsaka Zawjin Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala kana rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam yusalli fi suhbatihi qaida wa yaqra'u bi sura wa yuattiruha hatta taquna akwala min akwala minha Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform his subha sitting and he would recite a sura and recite it with tartil so that it would be longer than reciting it without tartil so it's saying the Prophet ﷺ prayed his subha prayer. What does it mean, subha prayer? Subha means the nafal prayer. Why is it referred to as subha? Because it contains the speed. So you say, subhanallah. The Prophet ﷺ would sometimes recite a surah with tartil. What does tartil mean? Tartil means saying each part of the verse slow and with deliberation. So in this case, if the Prophet ﷺ prayed a surah with tartil, it would mean that a short surah would take longer to recite than what he would normally take to recite a longer surah. So if you ever see a recitation which is tartil or murattal, it means it's a slow and steady recitation. And the Prophet ﷺ sometimes would recite short surahs but that wouldn't mean that short surah would take less time than a long surah if it was prayed with tartil. If it was prayed with tartil, that short surah would actually take longer to have been recited than a long surah. We read maybe two, three more hadith and then make a short surah. And Aisha ta anna nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam lam yamut hatta kana akfaru salatihi wa huwa jalis. Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha relates that the Prophet sallallahu did not pass away until most of his nafal prayers were performed sitting. So what does this show? This shows that the Prophet sallallahu his preference was to stand. He would prefer to stand and pray. But his nafal prayer became more sitting than standing during the last part of his life. Why did this happen during the last part of his life? Not that he became more preference given to sitting at the end of his life, but it was due to the illness and weakness of his body. So only in this situation did the Prophet begin to prefer 
sitting in his nafal prayers. But this goes to show that the Prophet would give us options of sometimes you can stand in your nafal prayer and sometimes you can sit in your nafal prayer. If you are healthy and capable, you should be standing. But the Prophet during the last part of his life, most of his nafal prayer was actually sitting, but the main reason why was due to the weakness of his body. We read uh, two more hadith. عن ابن عمر قال صليت مع النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم ركعتين قبل الظهر وركعتين بعدها وركعتين بعد المغرب في بيته وركعتين بعد العشاء في بيته ابن عمر said I perform the with the messenger of Allah صلى الله عليه وسلم two cycles of prayer before Zuhur two cycles after and two cycles after the Maghrib prayer in his house and two cycles of Isha in his house so the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم would prefer to pray the Nafal and Sunnah in his house because there is more reward in praying the Sunnah and Nafal in your house than in the Masjid but if somebody would struggle to pray Sunnahs and Nafal at home then for him it is better to pray in the Masjid if it's the difference between praying and not praying but if he is able to then praying in the home is actually better and it is said that Praying in the home is even superior than praying inside the car. Because praying at home is between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only. And this is the most beloved to Allah. So why is the fard prayer better in the mosque and with jama'ah? Because this is something that everybody has to do. There's no showing off in the fard prayer. So it is better that people are encouraged to do what they have to do, and it is easier to do it when everybody does it together. So, we'll read one last hadith. And Hafsata Anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kana yusalli raka'atayni kina yadhu al-fajr. Hafsa relates that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform two cycles of prayer before fajr. This is referring to the two sunnah of fajr. And the two sunnah of Fajr are considered the greatest sunnah from all of the sunnah prayers. So much so that the Prophet ﷺ says, Raka'at al-Fajr khayr min al-dunya wa ma fiha. That the two rakats of Fajr is better than the entire dunya and everything inside of it. So I pray Allah Azza wa Jal gives us the tawfiq to do amal upon all the good that we have said. He will make a quick short to walk. Allahumma rabbana atina fi dunya hasanata wa fil akhirati hasanata wa kina adab al-nar. Allahumma hina nas'alka min khayr ma sa'alaka minhu nabiyaka Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa na'udhu bika min shayr ma sa'ala minhu nabiyaka Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa anta al-musta'an wa alayhi wa sallam wa la hala wa la quwata illa billahi al-abir al-abir. Allahumma kfir lana zhubana wa kfir anna sayyatina wa tawafana wa al-abar. Ya aziz wa ya gaffar. يا رب العالمين اللهم أحسن أحوال المسلمين في فلسطين يا رب العالمين اللهم أحسن أحوال المسلمين في كل مكان يا ذا الجلال والإقرار اللهم آتنا كلنا من خير الخواتيم يا رب العالمين اللهم اغفر كل المسلمين من سيدنا آدم إلى يوم الدين سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يصفون والسلام على المرسلين after the budget prayer, they will desert to transfer the final one once again.